and uh, you know we talked about God he, he told me about his wife and you know how she straightened him out you know he was a bad alcoholic and you know he's about to die he drank so much and uh, and she really was a blessing in his life and so you know the Bible tells us that God is a father of the fatherless he is a defender of widows and widowers too evidently and and uh, you know when I left uh, he, he said thank you for coming by and talking to me and, and uh, making me laugh and uh, I feel better you know and so God God cares about lonely people yeah. absolutely he does and so I want to speak to you for just a moment about being alone in a crowd because <laughs> you can be surrounded by people and be alone and feel alone, like like nobody really cares about you. You feel like like you know you don't belong, and and uh, you know I I remember what that was like. There are many lonely people in 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 the world, and uh, uh, a lot of loneliness uh, comes from from a spirit of rejection. You know, sometimes because we were rejected when we were young, uh, we have a hard time. Uh, you know, uh, getting close to anyone, or uh, we were hurt, and so we have a hard time letting anyone close to us. And so, you know, there's a lot of lonely people because of rejection. And you know what rejection is, really? It's it's because of an experience or many experiences in our life that those who who should have loved us didn't. You know, uh, you know they sometimes it, it's because there was neglect. You know, neglect happens, doesn't it? Yes. You know, especially, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, with uh, addictions, you know, if you're talking about alcohol or drugs or whatever, sometimes, you know, the person who is suffering from addiction, they don't even think about the fact that they're rejecting the ones they're supposed to love. You know, and they end up really hurting the people that 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 they love the most, and and those those people are wounded, and they're they're scarred. Uh, sometimes it's mom or dad that didn't care about them, or there's a divorce. Divorce is, is very painful. It's absolutely painful. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, someone gave a, an example of what divorce is like, and and it's like taking two sheets of paper and gluing them together, covering the entire sheet, gluing them together. How many know the Bible says when, when a man and a woman get married, they become one flesh? And so, and I don't know if you've ever tried to take apart a piece of paper that's been glued, you know, the whole sheet. I mean, you might be able to take it apart, but it doesn't come apart whole. It comes apart all torn, and, and it, it's not like it was when it was not glued. It's, it's damaged. And so sometimes our lives get damaged because of relationships that, that break. And so, you know, that, that's life. You know, the, this world is, is a very evil place and it's hard. Life is hard. How many would agree with that? Life is hard. And life without Jesus is even harder. And so, so... Um, Sometimes, you know, we live in a, in a culture where people don't get married, you know, and because they don't get married, but they're together, they haven't made a commitment to each other. And there's no commitment between them and God. That union is not established as, as it should have been. And so oftentimes when they're strapped, they just break up and it hurts. And it, it makes it hard to bond with, with someone else. You know, sometimes there are several relationships, and after a while, uh, you know, the, you know, the hurt is is so much that that you don't even really feel close. It's hard to love when you've been hurt a lot. You know, when you've been rejected and and kind of, I, I guess you could say, kicked to the curb uh, or thrown under the bus or however you want to say it. And so, there's a lot of lonely people in the world. And that's, that's, that's sad. Sometimes we're the ones that are antisocial. This was, this, this was me. I was an antisocial person. I lived up in the mountains away from everybody. Okay. But sometimes we're antisocial because of shame. 
because we're ashamed of, of ourselves. We're ashamed of what we what we've done, what we have become, you know, and what we've allowed to take place in our life. Sometimes, you know, we, uh, a lot of times in, in our culture, uh, people are abused, they're sexually abused when they're children. It happens more than you would imagine. And, and, uh, and so it damages a child to be sexually abused. And then the sexually abused will become abusers and it's it's a very it's like a, a self perpetuating cycle and then uh, but as as a person grows older you know they start making decisions that you know didn't have anything to do with with the past but now they're doing this themselves okay and so what happens is our failures in life damage our self perception you know the way we see ourselves I, you know, I remember times where I would look at myself in the mirror and I would despise that person. You know, uh, you're disgusting. You, you're terrible. You know, one of the videos that we watched recently was uh, about a young woman who, who uh, you know, grew up in a, started out in a Christian home, but they left the church and she eventually uh, fell into drugs and alcohol and, and, and actually uh, fell into prostitution. And she tells in her story, she said that she's completely hooked on heroin. Uh, and we saw this, uh, I think we showed it Monday night, we saw it again. And every time I see it, I'm, you know, it's like, it reminds me. Uh, and, and so, she, you know, she's so far down, body full of tracks from her shooting heroin, weighs maybe 80 pounds. And, and she gets a, a realization that I'm worthless. She couldn't even sell herself anymore to, to supply her habit. How sad is that? You know? And so we don't want to be around others because we don't love ourselves. You know? And uh, and uh, we're, we're filled with self-hatred and self-loathing. You know, uh, uh, self-mutilation comes as a result of that. You, you've seen people who are cutters. You know, they're cutters because they're trying to numb the pain in their heart by cutting themselves physically. Some have said, I, just so I could feel something, I, I cut myself. And, and you know, there, it's, it's, uh, it's demonic. It's, uh, you know, it manifests in different ways, the self-hatred. Some of it uh, manifests in, in bulimia, in anorexia. Uh, those are the results of being tormented in your mind. And when I when I got saved, I, it took me a long time to go to church because I didn't want to be around other people because I felt like when they get to know me, who I really am, they're going to reject me. They're not going to want to 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 be anywhere around me. You know, there are people who are stigmatized today. You know, a lot of the, the those who are sexually confused feel, you know, a lot of self-loathing. Uh, those who are, who, uh, who uh, you know, say, well, I'm, I'm trans. Uh, did you know that a lot of, a lot of young women who say, who identify as boys end up committing suicide, the majority, because they're so tormented. And actually what ends up happening is they end up being very, very lonely. Like nobody cares about me. Nobody wants to be with me. Nobody loves me. And so it, it, it's very painful. And so in order to keep from being hurt, many people will withdraw from social interaction because, you know, just around people. You know, when we were kids, you know, if you had any kind of flaw uh, and you went to school, man, people would, it, kid, other kids can be cruel, huh? You know, if you were fat, they, they gave you names, you know, if your ears stuck out, like mine, mine stuck out. And so, you know, people would make fun if your teeth were crooked, and no matter what it was. If you were skinny, you know, they'd give you names like Twiggy or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and just be mean. And so you withdraw from people. And I just want to say this, you know, that the last place that anyone should be lonely 
is in the church of Jesus. Because you know what the church is? The church is a place for healing. The church is a place for forgiveness. It's a place where we find and experience God's love and healing from all the hurts of this world and this life. And so in our scripture, it says, he's the father of the fatherless and defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. And God sets the solitary in families. Amen. God sets the solitary in families. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that word family is literally talking about home. Home. You know, home is a place where, where a person should feel safe. Amen? Amen. A place where, you know, they're, they're free to be themselves. You know, they can let their hair down, so to speak, and just be who they are. One of the things that I so loved about, about going to church and, and learning to serve God is that I didn't have to act like I was something that I wasn't. You know, it was, a, it, was a, it was an astonishing thing to me to discover, hey, you know, these people like me even though they're getting to know me. You know, I'm sure I got on people's nerves and stuff, but it's, one, it's an awesome thing to be accepted. Yes. Amen. An awesome thing to feel welcome. Yes. Amen. That, you know, that's something that all of us should, should strive to, to make any visitor who comes in here feel welcome. Amen. Like, that, like they're cared about. Like somebody, you know, uh, wants to, to, to get to know me. Because so many people are wounded. They're hurt. And so um, just uh, this last week uh, in, I believe it was this week in the Tucson church, uh, Pastor Roman Gutierrez preached. Uh, he, he shared his testimony. And so I, I uh, uh, downloaded uh, the section of his, his sermon. And I want to share it with you, okay? So it's short. It's only like 22 minutes. But I really want you to see this because we're talking about someone who is absolutely dysfunctional and now you see him there he's a preacher of the gospel been saved 25 years married and and serving jesus has a powerful church in mccallum texas amen and so his testimony is absolutely astonishing amen you might want to uh, just pay close attention to what he said because i'm what i'm telling you about people being hurt you're going to see uh, okay so let's go ahead and, and run that glory to god amen matthew 18 Verse 11, if you have your Bible with you this evening, you know, I always pray that God would use me somehow to, you know, to touch people, to to touch the church. Um, but with a church like Tucson, you actually get ministered to more <laughs> than you are ministering. Amen. I just want to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, I'm so grateful, amen, to be a part of this family, to be your friend. I'm so grateful, amen, for my relationship with Pastor Warner, uh, amen, uh, and the Sister Mona, I love him to death. And I'm just, I'm really glad to be here tonight, as you can tell, amen. And so, thank you uh, for being you. And uh, I want to share my testimony tonight. Now, you know the drill. I've been coming since 2005. So, there might be one or two people here that have heard my testimony before. I need, uh, I need you guys to participate, and so when I say those parts you already heard, you need to promise me that you're going to go, ooh, ah, wow, and it just helps the people that have not heard the story, amen, and so let's do this together tonight. Uh, I often share, and if you've read my book, Twice Dead, uh, you know, I, I often talk about a bridge that I used to live under. When I got saved at the age of 25, I was living under a bridge for uh, about three months, maybe a little over three months. And I want to show you a little vi uh, video clip of this. A little video clip of this. So I'm actually st standing under the bridge, and I'm taking, this is uh, uh, what we call Six Mile Creek. It's just a few blocks away from my mother's house. And you see that hole right there. Uh, in just a minute, maybe when we come back to it, we can pause it there. But I knew of this uh, creek, this bridge, and this place where that hole is uh, because we used to party here. We used to party here, and then we used to also rumble here. Back then, we called them rumbles. They were gang fights. And so, you know, it'd be about 50 of us, 
uh, against 50 of them. And so that's why I knew of this bridge and I knew of this, this hole under this bridge. Now I want to show you a picture. And uh, in this picture, I'm about 15 feet into that black hole that we just passed. And so this is where God found me. I used to live in this hole for about three months. Now, when I say I used to live in this hole, right, I didn't, uh, you know, drink coffee and have tea here all day long. All I would do was sleep in this hole. I had a sleeping bag that I used to sleep in. Uh, it was June when I got saved. And uh, June in San Antonio, Texas is extremely hot. I'm talking about three digits. The reason I slept in a sleeping bag was because of the sewer rats and the big roaches. Uh, which I woke, to, woke up to many nights. Now, Matthew 18, 11 says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That was me at age 25. I was completely lost in my sin. I've been struggling with an addiction of heroin for uh, over 14 years. My life didn't start in this hole, though. My life started like a lot of families' lives. It started in a broken home. My mother got pregnant with me when she was 15 years old, and by the time she was 19, she'd already been married and divorced. And so now she's got a kid to take care of. My mother used to love to go dancing. She used to love to drink. And uh, we lived in a, in a duplex home, and I remember the house of this day. It had uh, iron window bars uh, and, uh, and door uh, iron bars also. And so what my mother would do when I was about three, four years old, is she would put me to sleep, she would take off and lock me in the house, and she would take off and go and drink, go party, go dance. And many times she wouldn't come back until the following day. Well, one weekend, I'm already about five years old, she meets a guy, and this guy takes her out of town for four days. So she leaves me in the closet for four days. I'm talking about no food. I'm talking about no water. I'm talking about no light. And so I'm in this uh, closet. Um, me and my mother, we had a very hateful relationship. I resented my mother. She resented me. Like I said yesterday, I was nine years old when uh, my mother uh, spit in my face. As she spit on my face, I remember wiping the spit from my eyes and her putting her finger in my face and saying, you are the biggest mistake of my life. She said, I wish I would have aborted you when I had the chance. Now, how many know when you hear your own mother speak those kind of words, especially to a nine-year-old boy, it does a lot of damage on the inside. On the other hand, I had my father. I loved being around my father, but as I told you yesterday, he was hardly ever around him, and he always made promises that he would break. He, he told me one, uh, one Friday, he says, I'm on my way to get you. We're going to spend the weekend together. I'll be there in 30 minutes, and so I'm excited, man. I'm going to go spend the weekend with my father. And 30 minutes pass, he doesn't show up. 40 minutes pass, he's not showing up. I'm thinking, man, another broken promise as usual. The phone rings, uh, and uh, I run to the phone thinking it's my father, and I pick up the phone on the other line is my aunt. It's my father's sister. She's crying. She said, son, I'm sorry, but we just found your father dead in the restroom with a needle still stuck in his arm. Um, and he all deed at the age of 29. I was 11 when I received that call. I remember just getting that phone and being so angry at God. I threw the phone at the wall. I dropped to my knees and I pointed my finger up at God and I said, the same way you took my father, you're going to take me. And just three months after my father's death, at the age of 11, I shot heroin for the first time in my veins. 11 years old when I started shooting heroin. I was 12 when I got incarcerated for the first time. Broke into a convenience store on New Year's Eve. We sold 112 cases of beer, and uh, they caught us, and so they, they put me in a juvenile facility there in San Antonio. Uh, I ended up breaking a kid's nose in there, and so they've given me six months to start with, and because I broke the kid's nose, they added seven more months to me. I ended up doing 13 months. By the time I get out, uh, I'm now 13 years old. I'm living with my grandmother. Me and 14 of my cousins have been dumped there at my grandmother's house to be raised by my grandmother. I remember getting to her house and there's nobody there. I knew that she kept a, a large bottle of sleeping pills uh, in her medicine cabinet. And so what I did is I went straight to that medicine cabinet. I grabbed that bottle of pills um, and I swallowed 82 sleeping pills. I'm 13 years old uh, and I don't want to live anymore. I'm 13 years old, and every word my mother had ever spoken into my life, I felt. 
I felt like I had no purpose. I felt like I never should have been born. I remember just waking up from that scene and getting heavier into drugs and alcohol and violence. I start getting familiar with the gang life. And at 15 years old, me and some friends were partying. We get violent with each other. And I end up, you know, he ends up running out of the house uh, and uh, he, he lived down the street in a corner house. And so I'm giving chase. It's already past midnight. We're wasted on drugs and alcohol. And so he's running up. I'm trying to catch him. He gets to his house. He runs inside of his house, locks the door. And I'm right behind him. And I start pounding on his door. I'm kicking his door. I'm trying to get inside. And as I'm pounding on the door, I notice that the, the curtains on the window, they open. And when I saw the curtains open, I saw a face and I thought it was my friend. So I ran over there and I punched him right through the window. And so as I pulled my arm out, the jagged glass, <clears throat> it cut my arm in half. And so I cut it from one end all the way to the other. Immediately half of my arm comes undone. It's hanging on by just a little bit of a meat and tendons on this side of tissue. I mean, my arm is just swinging while it's hanging on and the blood is just gushing out in every direction. I remember just grabbing my arm and trying to run for it. Uh, and as I'm running, I take about two steps and I collapse in a puddle of my own blood. Can you guys see that? See the way that moves? <laughs> Never had it that close up before. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I forgot where I was. And so, <laughs> I pull my arm out, I'm bleeding to death, uh, and so the paramedics, they come, they get me, they put me in the back of, uh, you know, the ambulance, they drive me to the nearest hospital, and by the time I get there, they, they declare me dead. My first DOA at the age of 15, I was counted dead for over six minutes. And so, before I go any further, you know, a lot of times my revivals uh, attract people that want to know if people that died saw anything when they died. Um, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Nobody said, come to the light, or nothing like that. <laughs> if I would have seen anything, I would have seen hell, I promise you, the way that I was living. <clears throat> I woke up from that scene, I wake up to a nurse telling me, man, you should be grateful. Uh, you died, God gave you a second chance, and that's the last thing I wanted to hear. I hated God with a passion at that age, um, and I came out of the hospital. You would think a death experience would have changed somebody. Well, for me, it changed me for the worse. And so now, I'm known on, at, on the streets as the guy that died and came back to life, and so I have a, an image to live up to now. And at the age of 16, man, our gang is fighting another gang in, 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 um, in back of the school, it's probably about 50 of us against 50 of them. And back then, we weren't into guns. We were more into knives and chains and bats. And, and I'm not promoting that either. They're both foolish. So. But we knew that we didn't have any guns. And so as we start this fight, all of a sudden we hear gunshots. And so, man, we know we don't have any guns, so we start running for our lives. And as I'm running for my life, I get shot in the back of my head with a 22 caliber. It hits me so hard that it flips me in the air and I land on my seat, on my bottom. My friends are running by me, they pick me up, I'm bleeding from the back of my head. Uh, we get inside the vehicle and we take off. So at the age of 16, I cheat death again. At the age of 17, me and my cousin were at my grandmother's house. And we're fighting over a $10 bag of heroin. And so my cousin was a lot bigger than me. I wanted the drug a lot more. My grandmother, to this day, has a big old boulder there in her front yard, a big old rock. I got my cousin, and I body stand him head first on the rock. He passes out, man, I crack his skull. He begins to bleed. I leave him there, I grab the drug, and I go inside to shoot the drug. I then sit down on the couch, I'm watching TV, and I, can, I begin to hear him arguing with his mother. My cousin went down to his house, he picked up his gun, he had a 45 Magnum. He's there arguing with his mother. My aunt is saying, you're not gonna come in here with that gun. My cousin is saying, get out of the way, mom. I'm here, I'm gonna kill Roman. And she makes the mistake of putting both of her arms across the doorway to stop her son from coming in. My cousin takes two shots at his own mother, shoots her once in each leg. My cousin drops to the front porch. My aunt drops to the front porch. When I hear the gunshots, I get up and I start running towards the back door. My cousin is now giving chase inside of the house. 
I'm running through the kitchen. He's taking shots at me. I can hear the bullets as they're hitting the cabinet. I get to the back door, man, and I'm panicking. I'm trying to open the door, and I can't. He's right behind me, point blank. He takes his last shot at me, shoots me on my right side of my ribs. Uh, I'm 17 years old, and I get shot by my own cousin. At the age of 19, me and my best friend were, were fighting over a $20 bag of cocaine. And so he's 32 years old. I'm 19. Again, I want this drug more than him. I beat him down. I take the drug. And as I'm shooting the drug, he gets up from the ground and he runs inside. He grabbed the largest kitchen knife that, you could, that he could find. Actually, it was more like this. <laughs> My wife says every revival of the night just keeps growing and growing. It was a kitchen knife. She's like, babe, that's a sword. That's not a knife. Um, <laughs> listen, it was long enough that as I, I'm not aware that he's coming with this knife and I'm reaching for my beer on the ground. And as I'm reaching down, he stabs me upwards. He stabs me half an inch away from my heart. The knife goes through my lung. The point of the knife comes out of my back. He pulls the knife out. He stabs me a second time in my stomach. He pulls the knife out. He's going to go for a third time in my neck. And I... I reached over for his arm and we began to wrestle for this knife. And so there I am again in a puddle of my own blood. I'm 19 years old. Now, this is my best friend. So after he stabs me, him and another guy, they pick me up. They put me in the back of a vehicle. They drive me to the nearest hospital. And as they pull into the hospital uh, emergency room, they just open the back door. They push me out. They left me for dead and they take off. So by the time they get me inside the hospital, I'm already declared dead. This time I'm counted dead for over five minutes. So by the age of 19, I had already been declared dead twice on paper by doctors. And what I'm here to tell you tonight, beloved, is that way before a doctor ever declared me dead on a piece of paper, I was already dead in here. I was 19 years old, man. I was full of hatred. I was full of bitterness. I hated God. I hated my mother. I hated this world. I hated myself. At the age of 21, I started turning that hate into fighting. I used to make money. I used to fight for the Mexican Mafia. And so I was never in the Mafia. They would use me for fighting. This was entertainment for drug lords. They used to take us in the outskirts of San Antonio. They would uh, put us in these, uh, what they called pits. And, uh, and so we would pit fight. They would put us in these pits. Many times they would fight dogs, roosters. They never fight us. I fought from the age of 21 to the age of 25 in those pits. At the age of 25, I find myself living under this bridge. Again, I have nothing to show for but scars and pain and hatred. It's while I'm under this bridge that a friend of mine that knew that I lived, uh, that I was staying under there, he came and he invited me to stay at his house. He says, Roman, I'm going to be leaving out of town for a few days. You know, you're welcome to come stay at my house. Once I come back, you'll have to leave. And so I took him up on that offer. I got there on a Thursday evening. I remember just getting to the house. I had bought plenty of beer. I bought a large bag of cocaine, a large bag of heroin. I had a brand new pack of syringes. And I used to like to speedball. I would mix heroin with cocaine and shoot it at the same time. And so I get there on a Thursday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. I've gone three days without sleeping. I'm shooting, I'm smoking, I'm drinking. Late Saturday night, this drug's not doing anything to me anymore. So I filled the syringe up to the very top, and I had never shot that much up before in my life. I put that, shoot that in my veins, and it's so much, and it's so strong that it immediately begins to drip out of my mouth and my nose, and my ears pop so loud, man, it drops me to my knees. I'm, I'm overdosing, and so I had overdosed, you know, several times before. So what I do is I start crawling, making my way to the shower. I climb into the shower, clothes and all. I turn on the cold water and I'm under the shower head and I did something that I had never done before and that is that I began to cry out to God. I said, God, I said, if you're real, if you're up there, I said, if you can change me the way you changed my mother, I'm so ready. See that wicked, evil mother that I was telling you that used to spit in my face and lock me in the closet. She used to beat me until I would pass out sometimes. She got radically, radically saved when I was 21 years old. She went to a church service, came back to never again be the same mother. 
no longer drinking, no longer dancing, no longer. And I'm under that shower head. For four years, she's been inviting me to church. I'm crying out to her, God. I remember turning off the water and hearing the phone ringing. I make my way to the phone. I pick up the phone. It's about one in the morning. On the other line is my mother. She said, son, I was on my knees praying for you. She said, I felt God wanted me to call you. She said, son, please, will you come to church with me tomorrow? Now, I am freaking out. I just finished talking. I'm like, whoa, he's real. He heard me. I was shocked. I said, yes. She says, okay, I'll be there at 8.30 in the morning to get you. Service starts at 9. I hang up the phone, continue to shoot up, continue to drink, continue to smoke. 9 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning, rolls around, man. She picks me up. She gets there. I walk out. I haven't slept now in four days. I haven't bathed in a week. My clothes, man. I had a, a white muscle shirt on what used to be white at one time. My, my pants were so filthy, I promise you, if I would have taken them off and thrown them, they would have just stood there. I stunk. I reeked. I came out of that house. I came out with a quart of beer, a bag of marijuana in my pocket. Back then, I used to shave my head bald. And I had a, a Billy Goat beard or a full man shoe that came down to about here. But I would put gel on it and I would gel it out this way, real pointy. And so I have my quart of beer. I get inside the vehicle and I said, let's go to church. I'm ready. This is going to be my first time ever that I'm ever entering into a church building. Never had been to a Catholic church, Baptist church, no kind of church. She doesn't say anything, man. She drives to the church. She parks. I said, Mom, get inside. I said, I'm going to smoke a joint. I'm going to finish my beer. And, uh, and I'll be inside in a little bit. She goes inside. I smoke a joint. I drink my beer. I make my way inside the church service. And I remember walking in. There was double doors, probably about 300 people. And when I opened the door, there was an usher there. And so he grabs my arm, you know, just real friendly to, to go and sit me down. And so back then, man, I hated for anybody to touch me. Without even thinking, as he grabs my arm, I turned around, I grabbed him from his coat jacket, I lifted him up off the ground, I slammed him on the wall, I said, you get your hands off of me, I'm going to knock your stinking teeth out, man. He's like, hey, you sit wherever you want, man, ain't nobody going to bother you here, bro. <laughs> my mother was sitting in the back row, and I sat down, I sat down next to her, and I said, if anybody else comes up to me, and then song service began, like here. And so, you know, people are speaking in tongues. I mean, it was the weirdest thing I had ever experienced. Um, and as I look up to the song service leader, the song service leader makes eye contact with me all the way to the back. And he looks at me. And I'm like, oh, no. I turn to my mother again. I said, if anybody else comes up to me, I'm going to knock them out. She says, son, please, you're in church. Be here. I said, I don't care where I'm at, lady. I'm telling you, I'm going to knock them out. And as I look back up, he still hasn't taken his eyes off of me. He puts the microphone down, and he starts walking towards me. And so immediately, man, I just cocked my chest, closed my fist. I planted my foot. I'm thinking the moment he's close enough, I'm going to spring forward, and I'm going to knock his teeth out. The only problem is that as he got closer and closer to me, I began to feel just this overwhelming presence come over me. Before I know it, man, my eyes are swelled up with tears. My head drops, man. I can't stop crying. All I remember is him grabbing my hand and saying, Son, today's your day. The Lord, he has need of you. He said, Do you want to pray and accept Jesus in your heart? And I said, Yes. He grabs me by my hand and he begins to walk me towards the altar. So this is before any preaching. Walks me towards the altar. They begin to lead me into a prayer of salvation. And before I'm even done saying the prayer of salvation, halfway through, I get baptized with the Holy Spirit, man, and I bust out in tongues. And, and, and listen, yes, amen. I'm talking about I'm screaming in tongues. She called a Sunday. I don't even know what's coming out of me, man. It's the craziest. My hands are shaking. My knees are shaking. That was June 11, 1995. I walked out of that church service till this day, over 27 years now, to never again touch drugs, to never again drink alcohol, to never again go back to my thug life. The best part is that I didn't need rehabs, I didn't need programs, and I didn't need psychiatrists. 
All I had to do was bow my knee to Jesus Christ. Amen. Twenty-seven years now, say, this February, Valentine's Day, I'm going to complete 25 years of marriage. I'm telling you, what I gave up that day doesn't even come close to what God has done in my life. You're here this evening. You've come, yes, because you wanted to hear the story of the man that died twice, but the, the truth is that you really are hoping that there's a God in heaven that loves you. And I'm here to tell you tonight that he does love you. You were created with a purpose, and he does have a plan for your life. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. How many appreciate that? Appreciate that. That's a powerful question. And you know, what I was saying before is that, you know, you there's a lot of hurt people. And, you know, some of, some of them are in church. But think about it. God saves us out of the wreck that our life was. You know, and he brings us into his house, into his church, and, and he gives us a home. And he gives us a family. The scripture says, God sets the solitary in families. Amen. He makes our lives that were once useless, useful. Amen. He gives us a, a new purpose, a new reason to live. And, and more than anything, he gives us the promise of eternal life. He, he takes that which was the wreck of our life and makes something beautiful. Amen. Something awesome. You know, and so, you know, I, Pastor Roman, as I said, you know, if you talk to him now, you, you see his life, you would never imagine that that's where he came from. You know? And so that's the God we serve. He takes the solitary and sets him in families, the homeless guy living in a tube, in a pipe, under a bridge, gloriously saves him and gives him a reason to live. And now, you know, he's touching lives, you know, has a conference church. He's the leader of a conference church in our fellowship. What God can do, that's, that's what God does. Amen. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads together. To